So as Stormy and also from my side, a very warm welcome to our panel discussion on burden or benefit environmental sustainability in the age of AI. As Stormy said it already, I'm head of the Digital Policy Division at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, which is an agency for green ideas and projects. Uh, our primary task is political education and advocacy in Germany and in our 34 offices uh, abroad. One question we've been uh, dealing with for quite some time now is uh, the role that digital technologies such as artificial intelligence can play in uh, the fight against the climate crisis. Um, on the one hand, um, it could support climate change mitigation goals and adaptation, but on the other, other hand, it could also um, be a driver of global resource consumption and emission, uh, depending on the types of applications and the circumstances of their deployment. Today, we will take a, a look together at uh, the various factors that will play a role in shaping the actual outcome if AI will be, in fact, a burden or a benefit for environmental sustainability. We have a great number of uh, uh, excellent guests here participating in the discussion today. I'd like to um, start welcoming our guests here today in Berlin. Um, Anna Christmann, uh, she is a member of the German Bundestag since 2017 of the Green Party. She has been spokesperson in, on innovation and technology policy and civic engagement. I'd also like to welcome Grisha Bayer. He is a research group leader at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And his research group, Digitalization and Impacts on Sustainability, explores the effects of digitization on industrial sustainability, global value chains, and international cooperation. Thank you for uh, joining us here in Berlin. And now I'd like to turn to our um, virtual panel and start with um, Benedetta Brivini. Um, Benedetta is an author, journalist, and media reformer, as well as an associate professor for communication at the University of Sydney. This year, she published a book on Is AI Good for the Planet? Alexander Britz is head of uh, digital Head of Digital Business Transformation and AI at Microsoft, where he's especially responsible for a division on AI and sustainability. Cécile Huet is a Deputy Head of the Unit Robotics, Artificial Intelligence, Innovation and Excellence at the European Commission. This um, unit uh, funds and assists beneficial robotics and AI developments within Europe. Um, Vladimir Ragmanin is Assistant Director and General Director General and Regional Representative for Europe and Central Asia at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today in this discussion. Um, during the session, feel, please feel always free to uh, ask questions via live stream or the Q&A tool, and uh, we will take 15 minutes at the end of our discussion here to answer your question. Okay, so let's start now with a um, very quick warm-up question, um, which picks up our conference theme. You have each 60 seconds, and really 60 seconds, to uh, <laughs> answer the question. So the question is, what contribution can AI make to adapting to climate change and increasing resilience? And let's start with our virtual panel um, with um, Benedetta Brivini, please. Well, certainly um, there is an opportunity, but the major um, hurdle that we have is what do we really mean by AI? So if we define AI as um, commonly defined as the ability um, of machines to just mimic um, the human cognitive function, then we have a problem in dealing with environmental question. If we really are able, as the European Commission recently did, to define AI, in fact, as a collection of technologies that combine data, algorithms, computer power, data capitalism, data extraction, then we can answer this question. So I would say that it's really crucial to start by understanding specifically what we mean by AI application in this context. Thank you. Thank you. This was really quick. Uh, we continue with uh, Vladimir, please. Uh, thank you. I actually represent food and agriculture organizations. So I would say that use of digital, digital technologies and artificial intelligence make agriculture more efficient, resilient and sustainable, as well as more environmental friendly, enhancing climate change mitigation, while at the same time adapting agriculture 
to negative impacts of climate change in order to provide food security for all. So I am very positive about it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Cécile? Hello, good morning, everybody. So uh, I would say that since AI is the tool as well to optimize everything, so optimization of any resources we have, you just mentioned agriculture, but anything, any production, if you can optimize the request and the demand, you limit the waste. Optimization of energy, optimization of any resource we have will help in uh, decreasing also our carbon footprint. Of course, we don't have to be blind to to the use that the, the technology needs resource to run. And we have to fight both fronts. So using the technology to help us, but also making sure that we improve the technology so that it is uh, greener. So that's what we are doing in the commission. We are focusing and, and, and pushing greener AI and AI for green for the twin digital and, and uh, green transition. Thank you, Cecile. And uh, Alexander, please. Sure, good morning. Um, to be honest, I'd rather focus on, uh, you know, fighting climate change than adopting to it. Um, but, you know, we certainly come to that in a second uh, uh, in, in the discussion. But if you're looking at uh, the adoption, I, you know, I, I think, and you look at AI and, you know, depending on the definition, but in a nutshell, AI can help us to understand fairly complex ecosystems and, and also help us to sort of predict future developments. So in other words, you know, sort of allowing us to better plan for the future. And of course, it's an enormous amount of data and it's an enormous challenge. But when we talk about adopting, then I would say AI allows us to be prepared to, for what's going to happen. Thank you. And Anna, please. Yeah, I would even uh, go one step further and say um, I can't imagine how we can achieve our goals in climate protection in the next years without the use of AI because I think it's fundamental for the energy vendor for many fields um, that are in front of us and I think AI is one crucial tool um, to make this all successful. Thank you. And Trisha. Um, I agree with many things that have been said uh, from the other speakers. I go with you that we need AI to optimize the existing sectors, make them more efficient and have less impact on the climate. But I definitely also go with Alexander. I think the most specific part about AI is the calculation power. So we should take advantage of that power to calculate, analyze and maybe permute different scenarios. What is going to happen in the situation of uh, climate change that is going to happen and then we can prepare adequately for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you uh, for this uh, flashlight round. Uh, you all stuck to the 60 seconds, uh, uh, more or less, so thank you for that. Um, I would actually like to expand on um, what has been said. Uh, let's have a look at how AI uh, innovations can contribute to achieving more sustainability. And I'd like to start with you, Anna, um, because you're the expert, as I said, for technology and innovation policy in the Green Group. And uh, this summer you published a paper on um, uh, using data for change. From a green perspective, what exactly can AI and data achieve in the fight against climate crisis and which are the um, areas and sectors you consider the to be the most, um, to have the greatest potential? I think you said already energy vendor. Yeah, um, of course. And I, and I think uh, the energy vendor is one of the most important projects we have in front of us and uh, where AI can really be helpful and, and more helpful than we've been using it before. I, I mean, until now, we don't have it um, in, uh, in all areas we could. Um, I mean, beginning from uh, one specific windcraft uh, uh, where you could optimize it to, to the weather uh, forecast and, and make it more efficient, like the one single uh, power plant, uh, if it's so to say. And then, of course, to bring them all together. I mean, uh, every extra windcraft uh, uh, power plant it will um, need more optimization for the whole net. And, and that will be a task where we will need AI to have a, a very efficient um, framework of all these different types of uh, energy protection we will have um, in the future. We will have uh, many more different uh, ways uh, to get energy uh, and uh, not only uh, a few big 
um, power plants. And um, that uh, makes a big change. And there we really need digital tools to optimize this whole setting and um, to make it a success. And I think there we are only at the beginning to really mm -hmm. make use of all the potential and also of data that comes from um, specific um, cities uh, where we can see, okay, where are the peaks of energy use and uh, what does it mean for the whole uh, energy net. Uh, these are all questions where AI will be extremely helpful and, and I'm very happy that we have some projects uh, already going on uh, in this direction mm -hmm. where people try to, to bring these data to, together and um, to really model uh, AI um, tools uh, on the basis of these data and I think that we will need more of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Vladimir, we had now um, an example um, uh, from, from this area, but um, as you said, you work on agriculture, food security. Can you maybe provide us um, with a few best practice examples of how we can use AI in these sectors to achieve more sustainability? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> First of all, we have, if we talk about food security, we have a very big task. Uh, the year 2050, around 10 billion people to be fed with healthy food, uh, to be provided with a healthy food. So, and the second task for us, for you and organizations is sustainable development goals. And that's mean 2030, zero hunger. It's, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge and we need to uh, make better efforts to achieve it. So in order to achieve that, we need to use all possible innovation and technologies. And definitely AI and digitalization is in the minds of now, all the people working in agriculture and in the environment. Actually, in FAO, in Food and Agriculture Organization, we established the new international platform for digital food and agriculture, where we produce the platform for the discussions. And we have very specific, talking about organization, we have very specific uh, use of uh, digital technology and uh, artificial intelligence um, where we follow the agriculture water productivity of uh, Africa and the Near East. Emerging signs of droughts around the world, small scale changes in forests and to detect full army worm damage. It's very practical things that we do as an organization, but of course we need to work on the ground and uh, um, artificial intelligence is absolutely essential in today's world for weather prediction, just forecasting uh, robotics in agriculture, and of course, supply chain connections. It's, it's very, very important because during the COVID, we saw that uh, these supply chains has been destroyed in many cases. We need to make a seamless connection and uh, digital technologies will assist us uh, to do it. So there are many uh, issues that we can contribute practically, but there is also a larger kind of social impact we, we need to follow. And we need to try to overcome inequalities in use of digital technology. We need to uh, overcome in gender imbalance in using technology. We know that you, women in rural areas have less access to these technologies. And maybe not being um, exhaustive, uh, one more point, which we all have in the European Union, it's also an issue. When we try to connect national digital platforms, it's always a very sensitive issue. And we need to work on that, how to provide, how to keep the national sovereignty on those issues, but at the same time, make it useful for the people. Final point in this regard, in order to be successful, we need to work together and we need to work with the private business, we need to work with civil society and of course with the governments. So I'm sorry I don't want to monopolize the time, but that's the thoughts that are coming from our agricultural work on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vladimir. Uh, this has been really insightful. I think we, uh, we will come back to um, a few of the things you said already. Let's stick a bit to the, um, to the different use case because we have uh, lots of expert here, experts here, um, as for instance, Grisha. <laughs> uh, I saw you joined uh, the IASS in 2014 and you worked there on a um, project called uh, Sustainability Aspects of Industry 4.0. And um, I'd like to know if uh, you consider the digitizer network industrial production an area which can be in which AI driven technologies can be beneficial for sustainability and if so, how does it work? 
Well, I think it can have an impact to improve the footprint of the manufacturing industry. Um, I think one point that's quite crucial is optimizing the energy consumption in large factories, for example, like orchestrating the way big robot fleets work together um, in a sense that they don't produce as quickly as possible, that they, but they produce what is required with as little energy as possible. Um, another point could be that AI can help with uh, dismantling strategies, finding ways how to use these uh, resources that can be taken from products that have come to the end of life phase. Uh, and there's also another way, like bringing together uh, people who could use this secondhand material, let's say, and with uh, other corporations that have that as uh, waste yeah, products they can't use anymore. Um, but I would go even one way beyond that. I wouldn't just optimize the uh, manufacturing industry through AI, but I would try uh, to couple the manufacturing industry and other industries with the energy sector. So what, what you have said, I think that's such a complex task, um, identifying where energy um, is used and where uh, energy might be um, existing but can't be used uh, at the same time and bringing these demands together like a big demand response management system um, arching over sectorial borders that is really a super difficult task and I think that's too uh, complex for, for human beings or standard uh, simulation tools so that's really one point where AI can help a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Alexander, you um, explained already a little bit what you're doing at Microsoft. Um, more and more companies are turning to AI um, when it comes to so sustainability. I saw that Microsoft um, wants to be carbon negative by 2030. How um, do, do you actually measure this? Um, do you also account, for instance, for the emissions by the end user? And uh, what role does AI play in this? Uh, an enormous role, um, and you know, I would underline what Anna Christman was saying earlier. Uh, without AI, it would work. Um, so it, it is an essential part. And you know, from from a Microsoft point of view, we really believe that AI is one of the key technologies to help us uh, to reach our sustainability goals. Now, in terms, of what are we doing? Uh, it, yes, we measure. We pretty much measure everything we can, uh, and you know, we. We, uh, I would say we're not yet perfect, but we have made uh, significant progress over the last couple of years. And when you look into uh, what are we measuring, uh, we are really starting from uh, you know, the, the design of a product to the end of life, so the entire product life cycle that you want. So that includes also the use of our products. So in other words, you know, we have um, you know, products like laptops or gaming consoles and, and all that. And uh, we are also calculating the uh, overall energy consumption over the lifetime of the product into our emissions. And um, that is certainly something where, you know, we have also learned over time, to be honest. Uh, in, Ten years ago, we, we, we haven't done that. Uh, now we're doing it because, you know, we, part of our learning journey, if you want, has been it is part of our, our responsibility. If we wouldn't produce these products, you know, they wouldn't consume any energy. And if you now look into Microsoft, uh, our biggest uh, challenge really is all the emissions from our supply chain, you know, from, from the scope three emissions as, as they are called. So this is the vast majority of, of, uh, of the activity that, you know, does uh, the existence of Microsoft actually, you know, mean in terms of emissions. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the entire Microsoft universe, our own, you know, existence, if you want, uh, for those who know the term scope one, scope two, uh, uh, and scope two, uh, scope one, scope two, is about 300,000 uh, 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 tons of um, of uh, ca uh, carbon every year. The supply chain is 11 million, so it's 300,000 ourselves to the supply chain. The scope three is 11 million. So that is the the, the the ballpark we are talking about, and therefore, you know, we need to measure. We need to have the transparency and. Uh, AI really helps in, in, in the whole thing. I mean, if you look into, as I said before, the, the, the whole prediction part, you know, what is going to happen. We have, for example, applied AI years ago in our own buildings and we have found uh, energy consumption uh, savings of about 20, 25% year over year through the analysis through AI. And, you know, I, I could go on and, you know, just to, to underline uh, what was said earlier. I mean, we are, we are talking at the end of the day, one of the core capabilities of AI 
is the whole topic of optimization. And you now can think of the optimized production, we increase efficiencies, we lower energy consumption, we reduce downtime, uh, we optimize logistics, uh, we minimize traffic, all that is part of, of the AI capabilities. And therefore, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a very center stone of, of the activities that we're actually having, yes. Thank you. Um, Benedetta, um, you, um, we had already from a few examples now, and uh, um, Alexander also um, uh, sh showed this um, by pointing at, at this whole debate on efficiency, optimization. Um, I think transparency was also an interesting keyword. Um, what do you think about this whole debate on um, the potential of AI um, for achieving more sustainability? I saw you saying um, that AI is used as a, a soul to us, as a magic wand. Um, how, does, um, how does AI also impact uh, the climate crisis? Thank you. Well, I mean, the reason why I provided the definition at the very beginning of this conversation was that uh, very often definitions of, of AI have this sort of magic feeling to it, right? AI is going to save the planet, AI is going to uh, sort out chronic diseases, AI is going to save us. And this is a typical um, mythical thinking around technology that we saw historically since the beginning of every technology. And we see, of course, the ideology of the Silicon Valley being absolutely absorbing these ideas. But what sometimes, you know, this conversation is obfuscating is the idea that actually um, AI, and this is actually coming out uh, from the white paper on artificial intelligence by the European Commission, so the idea that AI relies on technologies. It relies on machines, on infrastructures that intrinsically deplete scarce resources. And of course, they deplete these scarce resources in the production, consumption, and disposal, therefore the entire production chain. So, you know, what Alexander was enlightening was that, of course, that's the major challenge they have also in, you know, by the big digital lords in the West and also the digital lords in the East, um, try really to reduce the carbon emission. But then the, the interesting thing about us trying to think of the materiality of AI and stopping just thinking of AI as a tool to save us um, is crucial here because like AI, and if you want to read the book, you know, I actually spent quite some time trying to explain it also in lay, um, lay member of society terms, right? So AI contributes to the climate crisis at least in four ways. Now, I mean, every computer scientist and uh, every uh, person on the panel knows that the most uh, you know, relevant uh, way in which AI can be actually detrimental to the, uh, to the climate crisis is the fact that we need computer power to start the algorithm. And we know already, because you know, um, this has been already debated, um, the level of incredible um, uh, carbon footprint uh, of the train of an algorithm. And of course, I could give you a very quick example because I spent quite some time trying to identify, you know, how, how can I explain this to the public? And we have a great study coming from the University of Massachusetts Armrest that showed that just to train a very common, you know, for example, a Google Translate, very common um, AI application, you need something like 284 thousand um, kilograms of CO2. Now, of course, the engineers would tell me, okay, I know this is absolutely um, not something we can generalize, but if we compare this to a very simple flight between London and Rome, the carbon emission would be 235 kilograms compared to the 284,000 kilograms that we need to train an algorithm. But this is just the first way in which AI, you know, is of course impacting on the climate crisis. The second, the second way is of course, we know the data centers. So AI rely on data to work. And, uh, and of course the data centers, and this is you know, something that Alexander was highlighting, are one of the biggest problems of the major providers, I call them the digital lords, just to uh, explain their incredible power, political, economic, and ideological. Um, and, and of course, then you see that a major struggle you know, to make data centers sustainable is the starting point of this conversation. Um, and I can see that corporations are moving forward, trying to reduce. But, you know, let's not forget that globally, globally, the entire production of energy and electricity is based 64% on fossil fuels. Now, we know from the COP26 
that we have only 10 years to reduce and we need to reduce our pledges and our carbon emissions, we need to reduce them by 50%. Now, this has become really an emergency and data centers and the IT, the whole IT carbon footprint is on a trajectory to be something like 14% of the entire carbon footprint in the world. So these are data that we should really consider and think about when we think and we say, oh, we just embrace it and we are sorting out our problems, we sort out the pandemic. And I'll give another example. So I mentioned the two ways in which AI is impacting on the climate crisis, but there are two more. The other major problem we have is with e-waste and is with the disposal because all the devices that are empowered by AI, of course, will need to be disposed of. And what's happening here is really, of course, that we are sending these highly toxic, you know, devices and, and um, you know, and that we discard them very often in countries in the global south that are already recovering from, you know, years and years of colonialism. And so we are, of course, like also violating, you know, land rights because we are polluting these areas you know we are making the water impossible for these populations indigenous population to drink this water bangladesh is astonishing you know as a as a, as a country where that is used for this type of waste and this is the third way and the fourth way which is something that really worries me because it escaped also, you know, the very recent uh, draft of the regulation for AI that has been just discussed by the European Commission, for example. Like, while we all agree that we should be banning AI-powered um, weapons, and, this, and there is an international uh, consensus on this, we never talk about banning AI applications to keep drilling and making the oil and gas discoveries more efficient. So what's happening now is that all of the digital lords, all the major tech giants are investing massively, including Microsoft with Azure, for example. So they're making major deal to make the drilling more efficient. And now, I mean, I think that the conversation, which is a very important conversation, should bring together climate scientists with tech uh, policy people and really try to start with the first question, which is an environmental justice question. So we cannot just focus on a limited, you know, ethical uh, framework, but we really need to embrace a broader framework and start designing AI with these issues in mind. We are living in an emergency. It's a climate emergency. We know this. And so we need to act and make sure because, you know, I mean, sometimes we might think, well, you know, AI to reach a sustainability go sustainable goals means greening AI. That is not true. There are very different things. And AI, because it's a, it's a material technology, because it relies on data, because it relies on infrastructures, is intrinsically extractive. And so we need to say it and start with that, you know, um, you know framework and environmental justice framework in mind. Uh, thank you, Benedetta. You mentioned already the um, uh, Commission. I see that uh, Alexander is uh, raising his hand. So before I continue, I'd like to uh, give the word to you, Alexander. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, I don't want to just, you know, uh, uh, take some of the arguments of, of, of Benedetta away. But, you know, I think in terms of data, it's important that we, we have the same view on it. Uh, when you look at these numbers in terms of carbon emissions of data centers. I think what we have to look at, either we measure it or we rather talk about the energy consumption. Uh, why do I say that? When you look at, you know, data centers, the question is, what is a data center? If you look, for example, at all the studies, and I've read a lot of them, uh, when you look at, you know, big data centers, hyperscale data centers like the ones we have, and some others, of course, also have, uh, we are talking about in CO2, so a carbon reduction compared to local data centers in the range of 80 to 90 percent. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one that you have to look at is, you know, how are these data actually actually run? If you look and we, we are trying to be as transparent as possible, uh, and I said, you know, we, we, we show our uh, emissions in scope one, two, three, and all sort of details. When you look at, you know, the, the calculation that people, people typically do, which is, you know, the uh, the 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 assumption that you would take energy from the local grid compared to what we actually do because we are running on 100% uh, renewable electricity, there's a, a reduction of another 95%. So in that terms, you know, it is really difficult to say, well, this is the CO2 footprint in general of a data center. So that, that's one. The second one uh, is 
just on, on waste. And yes, that's that's an enormously important topic. And you know, I don't want to uh, you know take that away. On the other hand, you have to also look at you know companies like ourselves, for example. We have set ourselves a target for 2030 to be a zero waste company. To you know, all our data centers are now you know reworked in the sense that they will become circular centers. So in other words, the hardware will be dismantled at the spot, and at least 90% of you know the waste will actually be brought into the the whole uh, cycle. So in that sense. I fully agree it is an issue and we need to tackle that and you know we but in terms of you know having data there and saying well this is we got to be specific and you know that's that's the only point I really want to make on that. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Maybe just um, uh, coming back to that, um, before I turn to you, Cecilia, I'd just like to answer, uh, ask uh, Anna a quick question um, on this issue of uh, uh, data centers. It has been said that they um, can be also, can eat up a lot of energy, even become a driver of, um, uh, of climate change. Where do you think we need um, regulation, but where do we also need incentives? Yeah, I think in a way, uh, the question of data centers is quite easy because uh, every data center can possibly uh, be run uh, climate neutral uh, today. I mean, uh, there is no technical question that it's not possible to run a data center um, without any form of uh, carbon emissions. Um, so I think there is a point of regulation and that's also what we want to do in the new government. We have it in our new uh, contract for the coalition, uh, for the Ampel coalition, that we want to secure that we have uh, from 2027 on uh, only climate neutral data centers uh, in Germany, that uh, every new data center will be climate neutral from 2027 on in Germany. That is the regulation that we want to have here and I think that should uh, more or less be the case uh, for uh, Europe at least and uh, hopefully um, for the whole world because I think that shouldn't be the issue. You can use renewable energies and you can use the heat that is um, coming from the computation processes and all this is not the case in many data centers we have today and um, but it's technically possible so I think uh, yes we should regulate it and yes we should just uh, uh, secure that every new data center is uh, climate, uh, climate neutral. Thank you. Um, now, Cecile, uh, the European Commission has been mentioned twice. Uh, Anna mentioned already the European level. Um, I would like you to uh, comment a bit on Benedetta's uh, points, um, the, these various factors that uh, how um, AI impacts also the uh, climate crisis. You mentioned in your uh, statement at the beginning um, all these uh, benefits AI also can have. How does um, the EU Commission assess this conflict in general? How, like, how can we um, build a bridge between AI and sustainability? Right. Um, so actually, uh, so we have different types of action. My unit is responsible for uh, the uh, the programs uh, supporting research, innovation, and and the uptake of the technology, and we work, of course, closely with the uh, the colleagues developing the uh, the regulatory framework as well. But in terms of uh, uh, pushing the technology in improving its um, it's a robustness, it's accuracy, but also uh, reducing the uh, uh, the energy uh, use. So we do research to to uh, uh, improve the uh, the resource efficiency. So using more efficiently data. So uh, also uh, using architecture which are less uh, consuming, or uh, optimizing the whole uh, uh, the, the whole uh, use of resource when when you develop and when you use use our algorithm and also running uh, developing chips which are uh, less uh, energy consuming so that's that's on the technical part where we don't think we have solved the problem still need research and development needs to be done to attack the problem as well from that front and then on the other side we uh, have a number of actions or our unit has been working in um, in robotics for many many years and many of the examples i've heard today about agriculture so we we've used robots for precision agriculture and drastically hopefully completely remove the uh, the need of using pesticide uh, reducing also uh, the, the 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 use of, of water and waste at any any moment in the um, in in the agriculture uh, in the agri the food uh, the agri food sector in manufacturing as well 
scale. We are uh, supporting uh, manufacturing, zero defect production, also towards zero waste and zero emission, but also yeah, the whole uh, optimization of the chain. So if you better anticipate the, uh, the the needs, the demand, and you optimize also the production to reduce the waste. We see so many manufacturing production plants who have to throw away uh, uh, goods because they, they, uh, they're not used. So, and also another thing which I don't think has been mentioned today in terms of uh, also sustainability and, and uh, 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 be also more, more robust to, to change into crisis. It's also uh, manufacturing, you could bring the manufacturing closer to the use. So reshoring some manufacturing and having manufacturing plants which can also adapt to the local needs and, and to be uh, uh, more tailored to the needs. Uh, and of course, the uh, in manufacturing, we uh, we want also to uh, also use uh, the, the manufacturing for circular economy. So we mentioned, we heard uh, dismantling and then reusing uh, uh, the, uh, the materials is something that we are um, we are supporting so both from the the research development and deployment so we have a number of, of activities and, and a very important aspect is to really build an ecosystem around that. So we work with the community uh, with that. So we have built a PPP, public-private partnership, where on the private side, you have all the actors from research, from industry, uh, and from the civil society to really define the strategy. How should we use uh, AI for the benefit of the society? And then on the other front, we work with the member states in the in the context of the coordinated plan on AI uh, to, to make sure that, again, we work together to be more efficient in addressing those aspects. And one of the, so, so we have a number of actions where we work together with the member states and uh, in the updated coordinated plan with them, uh, we have highlighted a number of strategic sectors where we want to work together to, to be more efficient. And one of them is to bring AI to play for climate ch change and environment. So, so then uh, we have a number of action. There is also the, uh, the, the, the program Destination Earth, where we want to model uh, the, uh, what's happening on the planet or effect on the planet in order to also take better decision policy making, which is more uh, better informed, uh, make prediction and adapt. But I agree also that we better act rather than react. So uh, we should first uh, try to do our best uh, to make sure that we don't have to react to those uh, uh, bad situations, but uh, uh, rather prevent them with all the tools that, that we have. Of course, we are also working on energy, on mobility to optimize the, the transport system to be more efficient and uh, less energy consuming as well. So we have a vast number of action to support uh, or will to really have the green and digital transition. They go hands in hands and one will not go uh, without the other. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I think you raised a, a number of really um, uh, interesting and excellent points. Um, I think this uh, involvement of the different stakeholders is something that um, we can talk about in a minute, which is really interesting. Uh, I just saw that uh, Benedetta was uh, raising uh, her hand, I think, after the data center uh, question. So maybe if you could just quickly answer. Yeah, because I'm, um, I'm always um, like uh, trying to find solution, you know, together with also major corporations and of course one of the biggest problems that we face is data centers being opened in countries that are very or areas or regions that are very desertic and, uh, and this is something that I think really like big corporations should consider not to, to stop doing because like if you read even uh, some of the most common, uh, um, you know, press releases, for example, from uh, DeepMind, but also, you know, uh, Microsoft, you will see that one of the biggest problem of data centers is water cooling and it's really really the consumption of water and yet we are still seeing even this year um, big 
big corporations opening huge data centers in uh, countries or in regions or states like Nevada. And we know that Microsoft is trying to do its best and it's, you know, operating with, you know, all these new um, kind of technology that are supposed to help with this. But, you know, the question is really, do we have time for all of this? Or is not about time that we use the political tools to actually say, well, probably in a, in a time of a climate emergency where the pledges and where the carbon emissions need to be lower of 50% in only 10 years, is this still the case to keep opening big data centers in desertic areas or can we actually find, because you know, I mean, some of the best innovative ideas that are coming to achieve sustainability and green in AI are coming from the tech workers movements and are coming from these tech workers movements that are growing from the grassroots in major um, tech corporations. And I think we should listen to these ideas because they are really experiencing and understanding the major issues. So that's, that's another idea. But I also think that it's important that we remember that we're, we cannot just refer to the data centers to green AI. We need to consider the incredible and massive energy that is consumed by the computational powers that is needed for the training. And the neural networks, um, the greening of neural networks is another major challenge that I want to put there because we have excellent speakers and I want an answer. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, Alexander. I know you 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 really want to uh, <laughs> uh, now um, make a point, uh, probably on that. I just like to um, to come back to Vladimir because you raised a really interesting um, issue at the beginning in your in your statement um, when talking about the opportunities I can offer in the food sector, the agriculture sector. Um, but you said that it can also come with um, social and ethical challenges um, like how can we deal with that do we need some kind of um, ethical guidelines um, code of ethics to uh, guide this development of um, technology <clears throat> thank you and I'm fascinated by the discussion and uh, allow me just from the very beginning to start a little bit with the I, I'm in the previous life I was a diplomat and I believe I'm still a diplomat when diplomacy meant win-win uh, and not zero-sum that's what I try to preach, and that's what, not only preach, but I believe implement, and I believe it's possible. For instance, when we talk about this uh, uh, agriculture and digital technologies, we need agriculture to be environment friendly. Digital technology is assisting agriculture to be environment friendly and more efficient. We simply need to find the balance. We need to find the trade-offs. And we need to base this discussion on the science, which Benedetta is providing very important statistics. But uh, what is important is to find this ground. And the uh, European Union, I know, is undertaking a very strong strategies uh, from farm to fork, uh, green economy in general, and biodiversity, all very important. Moving it into legislation. So we need trade-offs and we need to have a balance. In terms of ethics, uh, I was talking about the uh, imbalance and the inequalities on the access to digital technologies. And we have it in rural areas. We have European Union, we have Russia, we have Turkey, where agriculture is strongly developed. But we have Africa and some parts of Asia Pacific where we don't have this access. And we, when we plan what we are doing, we need to think about less developed countries and their knowledge of uh, actually the artificial intelligence approaches. And what I believe is very important for us when we debate these issues among the developed countries, and uh, if we talk about specifically about the ethics and uh, together with Microsoft, IBM and Italy, FAO is uh, co-signatory to Rome call for AI ethics uh, in 2020. This is a very specific document which has been prepared. But when we talk, we, we need to talk about access. Sometimes we want to have digital villages and digital rural areas. But even in European Union, they don't have an access to broadband in some places. So they would not have the necessary uh, hardware in order to develop efficient software. So these inequalities, and if we go further, it would be even more difficult. And that's what I say, for instance, uh, gender imbalance. Also a big issue. If we work all together, women, youth and men, 
We can produce much more, but we need to do it efficiently. And we need to address these issues and uh, to learn about it. Maybe I am just a little bit too strate strategic or <laughs> just general, but that's how I try to approach and we try to approach these issues. We, we need to listen to each other, find win-win solutions, and also uh, taking from my uh, Chinese education, uh, there was a saying in Chinese, Lang tui zou lu. That means walk on two legs. We need, we need to use both. And also another Chinese wisdom, mo shi go he, crossing the river, testing the waters. We need to, to know the signs, but always proceed from the practice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, even for, uh, um, especially for these uh, <laughs> wise words at the end. Um, let me ask uh, one last question um, uh, before we open the discussion to the public. Um, uh, Grisha, there's a still no like, real regulation uh, from policymakers to make AI truly environmentally friendly. Um, in your opinion, um, because I know you're working on that, what um, framework conditions, um, political framework conditions, uh, do, do we need to really develop this resource-saving innovative potential of AI? And uh, we talked about this already earlier, which um, actors should we involve in this whole process, such as civil society, for instance? Well, I think all relevant actors, such as civil society, uh, guys from the practice, uh, regulatory uh, organizations, but also uh, NGOs, for example, should be involved. And um, I think we're at the starting point of trying to find compromises that are applicable for, for all uh, parties here. And I think what has been said is that uh, the social and the ethical um, implications are very important, but I also think that the uh, environmental uh, effects need to be taken into account. So I guess a framework that is really applicable for all these discussions are the SDGs of the uh, United Nations. And if we bring together all these sort of peoples, use their expertise and have this as a common framework that all of us accept, it is possible to develop such uh, frameworks in the near future. I think the European Union has started to do that and I uh, find that pretty uh, a good starting point, but I think we're way beyond or not even close to a point where we say that that is a framework that is really uh, applicable and serves human and the environment um, equally. Thank you um, for uh, also a bit summarizing the debate. You know, Anna, you look like you want I, to... I just wanted to add one sentence because I really yes. would like to underline that what you said, that it's really so important to bring these two communities together, uh, the AI community on one side and the sustainability community on the other side, because I think it's a problem that both of them are quite... Uh, on, on the other, on, on other um, parts of, of, uh, of the scientific community. And I think we really need to bring them more together. And what a great mm -hmm. example is, I think, is the Umweltbundesamt uh, in Germany. They started to build an own AI sector in their Bundesamt. And I think that is uh, very crucial that we have these expertise on the technology there, where also is the expertise on uh, ecological questions. Uh, thank you for, for this point. Um, I'd like to open up the discussion uh, to the public. Um, I, but I also see that Benedetta is raising so, her hand. Um, but let's uh, first take a look here uh, in our room. Is, uh, is there anyone who has questions, comments for our speakers? A bit shy. Ah, Stormy. Yeah, thank you so very much. Um, this has been a fantastic um, panel so far. Um, what I would be, I would like to also come back to the issue of data centers um, and the uh, um, carbon neutrality of such. And I know that there's a lot of thinking of um, setting up data centers more in the north of Germany and in the east of Germany, where we do have a lot of wind energy, uh, for example. Um, and it makes a lot of sense to have them close to where the energy energy source is. For other um, uh, companies, that might be a little bit more difficult because they are already set up in the south of Germany. So um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about how we get the energy from one part to where it is needed um, and the infrastructure um, of such. I know it's not specifically um, AI related, but I think it's, it's really, really important to talk about um, the um, energy trassen um, and where they lead and if we also have the public support um, to get them through. 
Thank you. This sounds like a question to um, Anna. <laughs> question uh, for the whole <laughs> process of the energy vendor, how we get the energy from north to south uh, is not only for data centers, is for uh, for the whole industry that is uh, located in the south of Germany. I'm from Baden-Württemberg, so I, I know this discussion very well. And um, of course, uh, we need to have solutions for that and we need to have the connections from north to south um, where it is needed and sometimes it's very complex to to make that happen and um, but to come back to AI maybe it's it's part of the solution there also I think because the whole process of um, yeah. calculating where these trussen should be located and where also wind power should be located uh, to make it most e easy to bring it from one point to the other as uh, their AI also comes uh, into it. Um, but I think um, it's a very important question, it's not only related to data centers, but to the whole industry and energy vendor sector. And uh, it will be uh, a one task of the new government to uh, work very hard on it. <laughs> Great. Uh, any more questions here from uh, our public in Berlin? No. And I don't see questions um, uh, in the online tour, um, which is um, quite good because we can uh, uh, ask Benedetta and Alexander, who raised their hands earlier, to, um, to make a quick contribution. Um, well, I was just um, I was just responding to Vladimir because I really enjoyed his comment about um, what we tend to call um, data colonialism and the inequality, you know, that we see between, you know, the super wealthy West and East, you know, China, US, Europe, and the global South. Just to say that in terms of the data that we have at the moment, um, it's absolutely even in inconceivable uh, for most of the countries in Africa and even South America to either, even in the next five years have the infrastructure that could be necessary to run AI, for example. So, you know, this is very often a neglected area you know, of policy making. And it's something that, of course, for FAO is absolutely crucial. And I, I still think that embracing a more clear, even if you, if you prefer the ethical framework than an environmental justice, then in the ethical framework, you can still use the concept of harm and you can use the concept of environmental harm to really say we live through an emergency so we need to have the communities that are suffering from these emergencies and we know very well that unfortunately these communities are based in the global south but for the first time in the history of germany we saw these major floods in germany and in china at the same at the same time in areas that um, never suffered as much as the tropical areas for example of constant weather events and so you know having a conversation at the global level that brings all of this concept of environmental arm like as the starting point of all this decision making where to place the data centers like what kind of neural networks should we, de should we develop uh, banning all kind of AI applications that are used to extract oil and gas so banning completely completely any kind of AI application that is used for mining because we don't have time because you know the point is we need to clean the uh, electricity grid and 65% being based on fossil fuels now, right now, is not something that is sustainable. So we need to have interventions that think about that first. And I think we all have the legal and the theoretical and um, ethical framework that we can use for, for this without forgetting that the concept of environmental justice helps us also to avoid the sort of data exclusionism, the sort of data colonialism, the sort of violation and exploitation of the South that has been characterized in the last uh, centuries. So I think we have options. Um, thanks uh, for this positive uh, note at the end. Um, Alexander, you raised your hand earlier. Do you still have um, a point you would like to make? Sure. I actually would like to connect a couple of these uh, points that were just discussed. You know, uh, one on the data center. Yeah, it, it, it shows that you know sometimes things are not obvious and not necessarily always easy. You know, that was on the one side the point made. You know, there shouldn't be any data centers uh, in in deserts, uh, and there was on the other side the point made. Data centers should be very close to where renewable energy is. You know, well that's the reason why they're in deserts because you have solar power. Now the good news is you know the. Um, Technology has made advantages on, on that, and when you look at the, 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 the cooling of data centers, and we nowadays have technologies where act, actually 
breaks my heart if I see it as an engineer, but you know, this technology is actually liquid cooled, so you don't need extra power to do that, even if you're in desert. So that's one. Second one for all the ones that are concerned, uh, these data centers are now built, you know, I can talk for Microsoft, but that's not necessarily only Microsoft, in, in a way that, you know, you're looking into the concrete, you're looking into really every single aspect. And we from Microsoft, for example, we have set ourselves the target to be what we call water positive. So in other words, you know, have more water in the world that we actually uh, consume ourselves. So there, there's lots of things going on. Uh, two points I would love to make, however, you know, number one, I would want to underline what uh, earlier on uh, Anna Crispin was saying. I believe right now there is really no reason to run data centers uh, in a non-sustainable way. You know, and if it needs regulation, uh, regulation to do that, you know, then it needs regulation. We should regulate that and say, well, you know, we should have them on the highest standards. That, there is no question for me. The second point I'd love to make, even though I'm an engineer, uh, and I love about uh, to talk about technology. We've been talking a lot about you know how we use technology, and, and, and that's great. You know, I could talk for hours about it. But you know, one of the questions that we should also have in the discussions is why are we using technology, and why are we using AI? And you know, what you have, and we've discussed lots of them today. You have good causes where AI can help. But you know, you can also sometimes look and say, well, are we using technology always for the right reasons? Is it uh, you know for research on climate, or is it for pure entertainment, or is it for even you know less significant causes? That's one, and that brings up a whole discussion and say, well, we need to have an understanding of what it means to use technology, and you know that goes into the education sector where I see you know there's lots of young folks that are using technology without thinking about it. And I think that's one of the, the, the tasks we have in our societies nowadays and say, well, let's have a certain level of understanding what it means to use technology and if it's always good to use technology. And again, you know, as an engineer, uh, I love to have technology, but it should be used for the right causes. Uh, thanks, Alexander. You raised a really, um, really good point. Um, and I think this is also a good trans transition to my last question uh, <laughs> to Cecile. You have the task now to uh, <laughs> um, make the, the last uh, statement. Um, just because I sent you a question um, uh, beforehand, um, uh, looking a bit into the, into the future, uh, what is your prognosis? To what extent will um, AI be a boon or a bust in terms of achieving sustainability goals? Actually, when, when you see this nature paper, I think it was from 2020, where they try to assess the use of AI and the contribution or uh, the negative effect on the SDG, they analyzed the different aspects and environment was, of course, one of them. And there was already at that point a clear added value of using AI. And I agree, it should be used where it is needed, where there is a, a concrete and sub substantial added value. So uh, I, I think it, there will be a, a substantial uh, help from uh, from the this technology to uh, to be sus more sustainable economically and environmentally and also for the society as, as a whole. But we need to be careful when you, we use it. That's that's what we have also the regulation uh, in Europe. We want to to establish it to protect people. So because it must be human centric, it must be there. To, to, for good and for all. That's also the inequality we don't ha want to have. So we should fight on the different aspect to make sure that, that it is really for good and, and that everybody can, can benefit from that. And for that, we need to bring all the different actors, the, the, the users and, and the, the citizens must identify where, and we should provide them with the right information, where they can take advantage of that, where there will be an added value, and then make sure that the technology is developed in a way which addresses those challenges and take into account all the negative effects the technology can have. So the working together, and, and also we see so many different initiative going in the same direction but i think we should really join forces because working in parallel it's it's a it's a waste of effort so we try at our small level at european level to already you know connect with the member state build synergies among them but much more needs to be done and and at europe at, at international level there is the gpi working on that there, there are many many different things but but we need to to bring that together and and yeah Besides talking, acting, and, and make it happen. 
Thank you, Cecilia. I think this has been the um, perfect uh, last statement, uh, wrapping up the, uh, our discussion so far. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, uh, it was really great to have all these different perspectives here together. And um, I wish you a pleasant uh, continuation of the conference. Thank you.